Lillian Glickman doesn't look it, uh, and she doesn't act it, but she's been active in this space and a leader on aging and senior citizen issues for more than 35 years. She too was a cabinet secretary, secretary of elder affairs, a very pioneering secretary of elder affairs, very progressive force in state government. She's also, we've also been blessed to have her on our faculty here at UMass Boston in our gerontology department, co-directing our online Master of Aging Services program and our certificate programs. Without further ado, Lillian Glickman. Thank you, Ira. It's my pleasure to introduce our closing speaker, the Honorable Stephanie Pollack, who is the Secretary and Chief Executive Office of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. She was appointed to this position in January by Governor Charlie Baker. Prior to that, Secretary Pollack worked on transportation policy, finance, and equity as Associate Director for Research at the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern University, where she's also served as an adjunct professor, sharing her skills and expertise with the next generation of public policy leaders. She has provided over a decade of strategic consulting on transportation issues to the public and private sectors, including the Boston Transportation Department and Massachusetts Port Authority, following a distinguished career at the Conservation Law Foundation in Boston. Secretary Pollack received both a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Bachelor of Science in Public Policy from MIT and a Jewish Doctorate from Harvard Law School. MIT and Harvard, not too shabby. <laughs> I hadn't met the secretary until today, but I'm already a fan of hers. Most cabinet secretaries get a brief honeymoon period before facing major issues, but not Secretary Pollack. <laughs> she was no sooner in office when faced with our record-setting winter and the resulting transportation crises. I, like many of you, have been watching her various media interviews and her initial actions. She has been strong, direct, and clearly a take charge leader. It's my pleasure to introduce Secretary Stephanie Pollack. So thank you, um, and I apologize for getting here late. And I had actually hoped before I realized how absurdly busy my schedule was to even spend part of the day with you because we need to do more of these kinds of gatherings where we bring people together from state government, local government, philanthropy, the private sector, academia, because the problems that we face are problems that we will solve by working together. They're too complicated for any one part of society to solve. Um, but I am looking forward to spending these closing moments of the conference with you and to hearing from my folks at MassDOT when I get back uh, what you all talked about today and what we can be doing together going forward. I do want to thank Ira and UMass Boston for hosting this and for their great partnership. I want to thank uh, everybody uh, who organized this conference and worked hard to create an amazing series of uh, panels and all four of the tracks that looked at all four of the sets of issues. Um, and, and again, we look forward to working with all of you. Um, Today really was about beginning to build the partnerships that will ultimately enable all of us uh, to work together to reduce the number of fatal, fatal crashes and improve safety. And it's not just for our seniors, because when we make our transportation, transportation system safe, safer for anyone, we make it safer for everyone. Um, I had the pleasure of chairing a transportation committee in my hometown of Newton for a couple of years. And one of the more interesting subcommittees that formed itself was the Seniors and Youth Transportation Subcommittee. And the reason that they joined together is, is because they found that they had a lot of common ground. Uh, they both depended on others for rides and the ability to get where they wanted to go in our suburban community more than they wanted to. They both needed a little extra time sometimes to get across the street. They both 
were feeling uncomfortable sometimes in a vehicle, youth because they were just starting out as drivers, seniors because they knew their reflexes were slowing down a little bit. And so one of the things that I say frequently is that, you know, we, the people who are the customers of our transportation system and our agency, people don't think of themselves, let alone as an older driver, people aren't just drivers or pedestrians or transit users. All of us are people who have places to go and want as much independence as we can in getting to those places and want to know that we're going to be safe. That's what we all have in common. And some of us may need a little more help than others in accomplishing those desires, but all of us have exactly the same goals. And so for me, the exciting thing about the work that comes out of a day like today is not just how much it is going to make our system safer for our older drivers, not how much material it has given us for putting together a five-year plan that will really be a blueprint for the Commonwealth moving forward, but the fact that everything we do that makes the transportation system work better for our senior drivers is also going to make our transportation system work better for everyone who uses that transportation system. And making that happen and assembling that plan is going to require the partnership of everyone who came here today. Today is not an end, it's a beginning. Because moving forward, there is a role for state government and MassDOT to play and for local governments to play. We need to think about all of our users at every age and ability level every time we design an intersection. And one of the things that I think is really going to be important as we think about roads and infrastructure is that the framework that we have come to settle on in the transportation sector is this idea of complete streets. Uh, we're working right now at MassDOT on a certification program uh, that will allow us to work with cities and towns to advance complete streets, to adopt complete streets ordinances. The idea of a complete street is a very simple one. It's so simple that it's hard to imagine that it wasn't always the way we thought of infrastructure. It's a street that works for everyone. Street that works for the people driving down it. Street that works for the people trying to go across it. Street that works for someone on foot, someone on a bicycle, someone getting on or off a bus. And everyone in transportation is usually thought of in terms of modes. Cyclists, pedestrians, drivers. But the framework of complete streets also can hold the idea of everyone as people of all ages and abilities. Whether or not they are driving on foot on a bicycle, using a transit vehicle, using a shuttle vehicle. So we have a lot of work to do using this complete streets framework, thinking about how our infrastructure does or doesn't work for all the different people of all the different ages and ability who use it and redesigning it. But that's gonna only be one piece. We also are going to need the private sector, the folks who are designing our vehicles, because that's another important part of the infrastructure, and that's why it was so exciting to have automobile companies here, to have Google here. Um, we also are going to need the philanthropic center. A lot of the great elder services and elder advocates that we have in the Commonwealth are folks who are working through the philanthropic center, and some of them are here today and are talking about the good work that they are doing to create more options, more mobility options for our seniors. And so it's going to be that combination of the public sector and the private sector and the philanthropic sector all working together to create real opportunities so as we all age or when we are at a moment in our lives where we need a little extra time or a little extra help which can be due to permanent or temporary disability at any age we have a transportation system that works that gets us where we need to go that treats everyone with dignity and respect that respects everyone's time that is affordable no matter whether or not you are on a fixed income. All of those are very real challenges. I know a lot of important questions got asked today. I'm hoping that the beginnings of the answers uh, got made today, uh, but I don't expect all of those answers today. So the idea is from today, we can move forward, and we can move forward on all of the tracks that you have been engaging in during the day. What do we need to do to our infrastructure? And that's not just our roads, 
and our complete streets. And it's not even just our vehicles, although I think changes in vehicle technology will begin to change everything. But since I think of all of our users, not as drivers or pedestrians or transit users, but as people with a place to go, it's not just what the infrastructure does for drivers. It's, it's is the infrastructure safe for those who can walk but might be a little bit more unsteady on their feet and we need to have better sidewalks. And if we have better sidewalks, that's gonna be better for everyone, not just seniors or people who are unsteady on their feet. Our, is our transit system writ large going to meet the needs of our population as it ages? And by our transit system, I don't mean MassDOT's transit system. I don't mean the MBTA's transit system. I mean the transit services that are available in the Commonwealth. We have multiple transit systems in the Commonwealth. Some of them are public, like the MBTA or our regional transit authorities. Some of them we don't call transit systems, but they are. Elder services transportation, human services transportation. Some of them increasingly are the private sector. Bridge, Uber, Lyft. I don't see the private sector as competition for the public sector. I see all of them as creating mobility options for people. All of us need as many mobility options as we can have. No one more than those among us for whom driving is not always an option. And so all of those public-private sector together creates the infrastructure that gives seniors and older drivers, but everyone, the ability to get where they need to go. And we need to, to answer the questions that were raised in the medical track. We need to understand how we can extend people's lifetime as safe drivers, how we can help doctors and seniors and families make wise decisions about at what point it makes sense to reduce the amount of driving. One of the most important things we can do in the public sector is create enough real transportation options for people in all our communities so that making the decision to voluntarily dial down the amount of driving you're doing is not a decision that you can't get where you need to go or that you have to rely on the kindness of family members or strangers to get there. When we create more options, we make it easier for people to make smart medical decisions, smart personal decisions, but we also create options for everyone in our community. And that's what the mobility track was about and the policy track as well. There are a lot of pieces to this puzzle of creating a real, living, implementable, changing five-year plan that can help guide the actions of MassDOT, but also all of our partners in making the Commonwealth a safer, better place for everyone in the community, but especially our seniors, to get where they need to go, when they need to go there, safely and reliably, and perhaps most of all importantly, with the dignity that they deserve from having reached a point in a life well lived where they should not have to worry about getting where they need to go. So I wanna thank you not only for coming today, but for everything that you do every day for our seniors, for our transportation system, for our Commonwealth. I would be delighted to hear your comments and thoughts or to take your questions and thank you again for asking me to come and speak with you. I think we have time for a few questions since the secretary's agreed to stay. Would anybody? Or yes. yes. Hi, um, I think that I was going to make a comment before you came here about sort of what we need to do. And it, it has to do with scaling this. A lot of people have talked about this today. We, we all talked about how much this, the, this is coming, the big growth in the number of people. The resources that are out there today are just not sufficient. And so it's going to come from lots of places, but it also has to come from government. And one of the things that um, I would love to see happen, and I don't know if this is something that you can advocate for, is to start dedicating more resources to it. One idea is um, through vehicle registration surcharges or something like that. I know this is probably not going to happen in this administration, but it's something to think about as a way to plan ahead, to have a regular revenue stream to fund these programs. It's done in California. It's done in some other places. It should be done everywhere because 
we're basically all investing in our own futures by doing it that way. So the question of resources is already a critically important question. Uh, is always a critically important question, and we do need to think about scale. But I would also suggest that you think about, uh, I had the pleasure when I was in academia of doing a number of workshops with a sociologist named John Powell, uh, who like E.E. E. Cummings does not capitalize the letters in his name. So he's small j, small p, John Powell. And John Powell is an advocate as a policy strategy of an idea that I find very powerful, which he calls targeted universalism. And his advice to people who are trying to get society to pay attention to it, problems that it doesn't pay enough attention to or to give resources to things that they don't give enough resources to is that we need to make the case for the things we need in universal terms. And then we need to make sure that the resources that become available by making those universal encompassing arguments that help us build a bigger constituency, then we need to target them. So his advice would be, if he were here, uh, and I think I've worked with him enough to know, don't think about the safety of older drivers exclusively. Think about investments we can make that help everyone in a community. You know, I, I was doing a talk for, uh, for the Partnership for Sustainable Communities for HUD a year ago before I was secretary. And they said, now, now Stephanie, you need to understand you're talking to very rural communities here. So I'm not quite sure how you're going to talk to tra about transit to very rural communities. Transit, they don't have it. It's a pipe dream. They're never going to have it. So I got up and I said, every one of you lives in a community with a transit system. And they all said, no, nah, that's not true. I said, yellow school buses. Tell me which one of you lives in a community that does not have yellow school buses. The fact that they take kids to school for two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon does not mean that that is the only thing you can do with your yellow school buses. They are a resource to the community, but we have pigeonholed them as a resource to the school department. And most towns have multiple transportation agencies. They have a public works department. They have a school transportation department. They may, in fact, have an elder services department or even an elder transportation function. So I agree. We do need more resources. But the way to get those resources and the way to make sure that those resources produce the greatest return on investment is to realize that everything that you're talking about not only helps seniors, helps people who are permanently disabled, helps people who are temporary disabled. You know, my brother lived and died without ever having a driver's license. He had the same problems every day of his life that seniors have because he had disabilities that pre precluded him from having a driver's license. He needed to live in a community that had a set of transportation options. If he didn't, then all he had going for him was family members and taxi cabs. Um, there are a lot of people who will benefit from communities that do a good job. Uh, communities that retime signals and, and, may, and keep their sidewalks in good repair will help their seniors who need a little bit more time, but they'll also help their youth and anyone else who is out walking for recreation. So universal arguments to make investments, but then when we have those resources, keep in mind the special targeted needs of our older drivers and of our seniors who are no longer able to drive, at least in all circumstances. And I think that's a formula for success for all of us. Any other questions or comments for? Yes, Len. Identify yourself. <laughs> Good afternoon, Secretary. I'm Len Fishman, Director of the Gerontology Institute. And uh, thanks so much for making time for this program. You got a lot of great advance billing from uh, Dean Jackson. Um, we heard earlier, and you made reference to Google, uh, from Ron Medford, who was the head of the Google driverless uh, car program. And he mentioned that uh, California apparently had enacted legislation so that Google could test drive some of their driverless cars. I gather in part because the cars don't have components that typically are required in order to have a vehicle on the roads. Um, I'm wondering, uh, and, and I also had a sense in conversations that I had with uh, Ron over lunch, that they're looking for places that are open to this experiment. And um, you have detailed how great the challenge is for not only the older population, also younger adults with disabilities. So it's a huge part of our population. Um, if you've had a chance to think about this, do you think Massachusetts would be interested in joining California in facilitating that kind of experimentation here? 
So um, actually, that's pretty funny because I was just that. So I'm fascinated by autonomous cars. Um, we have a statutory obligation in Massachusetts to do 25-year transportation plans. Our metropolitan planning organizations are actually all of them across the state doing them this year, and the T has to do one every five years, and, and it's been more than five years. That means we're thinking about the year 2040. And one of the things I tell the folks in my building all the time in my planning department is, I know that you do 25-year plans because it takes us that long to do anything, but that's not the right reason to do 25-year plans. The right reason to do 25-year plans is to plan backward from the year 2040. So the first question in our planning process should be, so what's happening in 2040? And what you talked about today has everything to do with the year 2040. In 2040, not only is a higher percentage of our population going to be over 65, a higher percentage of our population is going to be over 85. And we know that that's when we see a big drop off in driver licensure, right? In 2040, we're going to have a different climate. That's another thing that we need to be thinking about. Uh, in 2040, autonomous cars could be a market reality in a way that it's hard to think about. I don't know, because I wasn't here when the general from Google was here, whether he talked about this recent report that Barclays did that actually looked at the autonomous car market in the year 2040. Uh, their prediction is, is that car companies in America will sell half as many cars in the year 2040 as they do today because of the combination of autonomous vehicles and shared ownership models. Um, because an autonomous vehicle makes the zip cars of the world even easier. It's easier to kind of shuttle cars around in a shared ownership model. 60% less land devoted to parking. No decrease in vehicle miles traveled, something of great interest to my transportation planners because the cars are so much more efficient that half the number of cars travel the same number of miles. They're just doing multiple trips for multiple users, right? These are huge issues. Right now, there are only four or five states that actually license on-street testing of autonomous vehicles. Massachusetts is a place that prides itself on being an innovation hub. So yes, we have just begun to think about this. Luckily for us, Massachusetts is also home to the Volpe Center, which is our National Transportation Research Institute, and they just did a roundtable of all the states that have already licensed autonomous vehicles and derived a set of best practices. So literally a few hours ago, I was talking to my friends at Volpe about sharing those best practices with us and with the registry so that we could begin to think about if we wanted to join that fairly small group of states that is experimenting in a serious way with autonomous vehicles. What could we learn from those who have gone first? So it, it's a great question, and I do think that the issue of autonomous vehicles is, is a big issue for not just seniors, but again, for how our transportation system is going to be so different in 2040 that, from what it is today. Any other questions or comments? Ira would love this. The funniest part of the Barclays, this is a report, right, on, for investors on, like, you know, 2040, is they compare... Uh, as a curve, a possible curve to think about, they, they look at the uh, individual household ownership of horses in the first 25 years of the 20th century and say that could be what happens to the individualized ownership of non-autonomous cars. Uh, question, please. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I'm Eric Rines. I practice geriatrics in Lynn. Uh, Several of my patients would like to get the ride, but they have to go for an interview in Boston, and that's a big barrier for them. Is there anything that can be done about that? So, uh, you know, the ride is another challenge that MassDOT and the MBTA need to be thinking about in this context and in a broader context, because systems like the ride and systems like the T were set up assuming that the vast majority of folks would use what we call our fixed transit system and things like the ride, uh, and even seniors are a little tiny piece of our, our population. Witness the fact, for example, that here's something you don't think about, but I do. If people in Massachusetts are aging as half as we do, and by law you are automatically entitled to half price rides on the MBTA once you turn 65, will we have enough fair paying customers on the MBTA 25 years from now? Okay, so we need to rethink the whole model because our model should be, first of all, that as much of our fixed guideway transit system as possible is usable by as many people as possible. We've made the first generation of investments in accessibility through a program called our Key Stations program where we picked individual stations and, and, and made them accessible and we're almost done with that. 
but we're just starting the planning for our next generation of thinking about accessibility at the T and how do we get beyond those key stations. The ride is supposed to be, and wasn't always, but is by law required by the Americans with Disabilities Act for people who cannot make use of the fixed guideway system. So, and it is a very expensive way to provide people with mobility. More expensive than senior transportation services, more expensive than health and human transportation services. So it's more expensive than other point to point, not just more expensive than the T. So we have to provide the ride, but we also have to make sure that we're providing it to people who need it. I agree with you. We had to go to a system before we, I became secretary where we were doing a better job of screening people because quite frankly, we were not enforcing eligibility requirements. So the screening center was better than what we had before, but now we have the problem that we have one of them. And so we do, we need to take a hard look at how we can enforce the legitimate eligibility requirements in a way that's more convenient for folks. And we're just beginning to look at that, but it is something I have heard, not just from you, and it's already on my radar screen, so thank you for raising it. Yes, please. I'm an occupational therapist, and I understand making sure people are qualified to use the ride because I feel like it was being taken advantage of by lots of individuals. What if maybe implementing them at RMVs and locations like that to have people come in and have their interviews and screenings done at some of the local RMV sites as a way to make it more accessible to people in the area? No, that's a great idea, and another idea we should, we should explore. Um, one of the interesting things that I have talked to folks about is the DOT actually has more sort of places out in the community than a lot of other agencies. They have six highway district offices, I have a dozen registry branches, I've got MBTA stations, and I don't think we've really thought about that set of assets and, and what it means that we actually are in people's communities and how we can use them better. So the idea of sort of using the registry is a great example of something we need to think about. Normally, quite frankly, the registry and the T don't talk to each other a lot, so it's Mass Dot's job to make sure that happens. I think that may be... Uh the right way to, to end uh, Stephanie's comments and, and the whole conference. Um, I, I want to observe a little bit of, um, you know, uh, prerogatives of the chair that I don't think the, the nation has a more intelligent, thoughtful, smart, energetic uh, Secretary of Transportation in any of our 50 states. And while she's only been on the job for five months, I think she's going to be the most successful and impactful Secretary of Transportation in America. And we all just wish you all the best, Stephanie. We just got a taste of how deep and rich and thoughtful her leadership is going to be. Um, final note before encouraging folks to take advantage of Ford's technology outside and its automated driving backup systems and whatnot, and the bar one floor below. Just join me in thanking uh, the instigator, uh, the conspirator, the, the, uh, the dreamer who put this conference together starting about a year ago, and we'll take it forward with action and implementation, uh, our own Professor Beth Dugan. Come on, take a bow. All right. And we're going to get that op-ed in the globe. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. See you downstairs.